Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first collaborative webinar of the 2023-2024 academic year. APSA is pleased to co-host this session with the AAMC Group on Research, Education, and Training, or better known as the GREAT Group. This session features six physician scientist training programs and their directors across six different specialties. My name is Rohini Gwynn, and I'll be your moderator for the evening. I am a current M2 MD-PhD student at Stony Brook University. We also have four additional moderators from the APSA team. They are Monica Rasmussen, Carrie Jansen, Cynthia Tang, and Sahara Gabor. They will help us during the breakout room portion of this webinar. So for those who might have found out about this event through the AAMC, I'd like to share a few words on who APSA is. The American Physician Scientists Association was founded in 2003 by dual degree trainees to better serve and represent the needs of dual degree trainees. Today, our organization has grown to reach students from nearly 100 MD or DO PhD programs and consists of over 1,800 current members. Today's session will include formal presentations by our panelists and will then be followed by a group Q&A. The second hour will be dedicated to breakout room sessions where our panelists will be able to share more tailored uh, questions and responses. All all rooms will be recorded, so please do not worry if you have multiple interests and wish to be a part of multiple of these breakout room sessions. I will now turn it over to Carrie Jansen, who will describe the goal of this collaborative webinar series. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, we're really excited to see um, all of you here in attendance tonight. Um, welcome to the second kind of episode of our uh, research and residency physician scientist training program webinar series. We're really excited um, that in this kind of second iteration or episode of the year, we've collaborated with the AMC Great Group um, to bring you an all-star panel of um, residency program directors and leaders in physician scientist training to, to educate us more about the different options for um, research and residency training and beyond. Um, the point of this webinar series is to really um, give people access to um, the opportunities available um, at the next stage of our training to continue on I'm really working in, to become better clinicians and better um, scientists in, in hopes of really fulfilling that physician scientist dream that we all started with. Um, so this um, will be the first um, of our collaborative efforts with AMC, and, and I think we hope to have a second session with additional um, program directors later in the year. But again, we're really glad to have you all here with us tonight, um, and thank you so much for being here. Awesome. I will now, and I, I apologize for not uh, remembering to include uh, Marzia Giasi, who's also part of the APSA moderating team. Um, so now I want to turn it over to Dr. Williams and Dr. Horowitz, who will be sharing more information about the AAMC Great Tops Committee. And I will proceed to share screen for both of you. So feel free to let me know when to advance slides accordingly. Thanks, Rowini. Um, so, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Marshall Horowitz. I'm the director of the University of Washington uh, MSTP coming to you from Seattle. Um, Chris uh, Williams has, um, may or may not be here. Uh, he is traveling. Uh, and so this is a joint presentation that the two of us have put together. Chris um, leads the TOPS Training Opportunities for Physician Scientists program uh, that's been sponsored by the AAMC. Um, and I'm uh, the co-director of this program. And we're really grateful for APSA's partnership in helping to get the word out about postgraduate training for those of you who are interested in pursuing physician scientist's career. Um, next slide, please. Um, the AAMC has assembled the Committee of uh, Physician Scientists that includes program directors and uh, student representatives from APSA, uh, a couple of whom will be presenting for their uh, respective subspecialties here. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a uh, pie chart uh, assembled from a survey conducted by Skip Brass, whom some of you may know, who is the University of Pennsylvania MSDP director and has 
put in a lot of effort um, along with his colleagues in tracking outcomes of combined degree uh, programs. Um, and you can see the distribution of specialties that physician scientists pursue. This uh, data, I think, is uh, specific for uh, dual degree programs, MD, PhD, and DO, PhD programs. But um, I, I'd also like to emphasize that there are plenty of opportunities for uh, MD only, if you will, uh, physician scientists. So uh, that group, uh, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a big tent and there's room for a lot of people. And uh, if you're in a dual degree program, it would be great if you could help get the word out that a lot of um, physicians enter research uh, later in their careers, including at the postgraduate phase of education. Um, traditionally, there have been three big specialties that most physician scientists go into, internal medicine, pediatrics, and pathology. But um, that doesn't mean by any, by it, at all, that there aren't great opportunities for physician scientists and other subspecialties. Uh, increasingly, uh, there has been involvement of MD, PhD trainees uh, pursuing academic careers in surgery and surgical subspecialty. In fact, if you um, looked at the nature that just came out today, there was a wonderful example of a physician scientist doing the sort of work that only a surgeon, in this case, a neurosurgeon could do. A really great article from Antonio Chiaca at Brigham and Women's using oncolytic retroviruses to treat um, glioblastoma. Some of these other specialties have um, not necessarily have been conducive to retention in careers of physician scientists in part due to the fact that they pay a lot better for uh, just practicing clinical medicine full time. But I think that landscape is changing for a variety of reasons and that they're becoming more friendly to uh, pursuit of scientific careers in combination with clinical practice. Um, across the specialties or even within individual specialties, there's huge variation in um, the requirements and pathways that one can pursue. Uh, if we may have um, the next slide, please. Um, many of the specialty associations offer specific pathways and specific certification pathways uh, for those who are pursuing either PSTPs or research residencies. And uh, these are just a few that are listed here, the American Board of Internal Medicine, um, pediatrics, radiology has a specific pathway through the Holman program and other residency specialties as well. Next slide, please. And correspondingly, uh, programs vary a lot in their structure. Um, so for example, at Massachusetts General Hospital, um, the programs are um, restricted to a department. Uh, they're focused on the resident and uh, each trainee um, has an individually tailored approach to how they're gonna set up uh, and divide their time between uh, research and um, clinical training in their specialty. Uh, in contrast, uh, if you look at Duke School of Medicine, it has more of an umbrella program that incorporates uh, uh, residents in different specialties and combines resources to provide opportunities for training that may be common to all. And taking that approach even more broadly, uh, there are other programs, for example, Vanderbilt, that have integrated training um, not just at the postgraduate residency level, but combining that uh, um, further down uh, the pipeline with junior faculty uh, and further upstream uh, by incorporating involvement with the MSTP. No one particular model is superior to others. And when you're looking at these programs, um, you should just be aware of their different structures and seek out those that you think might be most conducive and work best for you in pursuit of your own training. Next slide, please. There's a really nice paper that was just published. Um, uh, Dr. Williams was the first author and he worked in conjunction with a number of uh, MD, PhD program directors and PSTP and 
research residency directors from throughout the country. And uh, you can access this article published in eLife just by scanning this QR code with a little dinosaur up here. And it um, lays out the different structures and opportunities that are available and offers a guide as to what questions you should be asking and what you should be looking for in order to help you decide uh, which program might be best for you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and it's it's a um, uh, it, it's a long journey, um, and uh, the the pipeline from becoming a medical student to uh, faculty or um, industry or other ultimate career destinations that make use of your physician scientist training can um, be leaky, particularly at the transition points as you jump from one phase of the training uh, to another. And so it's important in evaluating programs uh, to seek out those that are gonna be able to provide you with the best support that keeps you engaged in research and helps facilitate your path uh, ultimately to career um, independence. Next slide, please. So as you um, go about and start your journey, um, whether uh, it's coming up or uh, uh, it's something that's um, you, you know maybe years away, um, you should keep in mind at least a few basic general questions. Um, historically, many research residencies and PSTPs have offered you admission into specific clinical uh, subspecialty fellowship training at the time um, that uh, you match. Uh, there have been some uh, problems with these guarantees. So most programs have a non-binding um, letter of intent that uh, is a mutual understanding that should you perform satisfactorily, then they'll be able to offer you a spot in uh, the clinical fellowship, but for various reasons are generally kind of administratively restricted in making these guarantees. Um, it's important to consider how much protected research time is offered uh, and whether these blocks of time uh, will be sufficient for you to do the sorts of research that you might in, envision ultimately doing. For example, if it's highly translational, frequent uh, short blocks might suffice, but if it's more basic science focused, you might need uh, greater lengths of uninterrupted time. Uh, also, some programs may um, have a certain group of mentors and research programs whose laboratories you can work in, whereas others may offer um, broader interdisciplinary training or may allow you to work in disciplines that are not traditionally associated with that specialty. You should look at a program's track record. That doesn't mean that a new program um, is necessarily risky or one that you shouldn't consider, but if a program's been around a long time, then definitely see what um, people have gone through it or doing and how successful it's actually been in terms of churning out um, this, uh, uh, people who are practicing the sort of medicine and science that you hope to be doing. Um, it's important to um, see what the salary and research financial support are and what guarantees are available for funding. Uh, and then finally, when you uh, go about your search, um, you should ask what makes it a program as opposed to uh, just a residency where you're really left to your own devices to figure out what sort of um, research it is that you wanna do. Um, and with that background, uh, I'm really delighted that we have uh, several program directors here to tell you about uh, their specialty in general. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Horowitz. So now I'd like to proceed to introduce our panelists. Um, I will have them introduce and explain more about themselves as they present their section, but the next portion of this presentation will allocate about six, uh, seven minutes for each panelist to give a broad overview about their program and their specialty track. Um, so just um, to introduce our panelists, first we'll have Dr. Andrew Nowak. 
Uh, after that, we will be followed by uh, Dr. Arun Rita, Dr. Chris Pittinger, uh, Dr. Emily Gallagher, Dr. Stephen Chow, and then Dr. David Mankoff. So I will go back to sharing my screen. And just one caveat is Dr. Nowak will be with us for the first hour of this, uh, of this Zoom today. So if you have specific questions related to pediatrics PSTPs, which is what he will give an overview of, please feel free to send your questions in the chat box and he will also continue to respond via that mechanism as well. So I will go back to sharing my screen. Okay, and the floor is yours, Dr. Nowak. <clears throat> well, thank you, Rogini. And first of all, um, thanks to uh, TOPS and to APSA for continuing to organize these amazing events. Um, uh, this is a really wonderful opportunity for us to talk a, a little bit about programs. Um, and um, my name is Andy Nowak, as, as, as Rohini said. So I, I fill a bunch of different roles. I'm an infectious disease pediatrician at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh uh, in the UPMC MedEd program. I'm also the uh, both the program director there in pediatrics, as well as the scientist development track program director. Um, and I'm the new co-chair for our national pediatric scientist um, collaborative work group, which is a group of a uh, growing group of 20 um, or more now programs in pediatrics who are sharing data, sharing strategies, and um, trying to promote uh, careers in science and peds. So I am going to talk about um, postgraduate training in pediatrics writ large. I'm actually not going to talk about my program at all, um, but I'm going to talk about peds. Um, and as I said, unfortunately, I will be leaving a little early tonight. I'm going to put my email in the chat after this as well. And so please feel free to reach out to me for any specific questions. Next slide, if you if you don't mind. Um, you know, thinking about trying to talk about pediatrics, what I thought I would do is uh, move out to um, uh, our program requirements because uh, pediatrics um, is a specialty that really is uh, encompassing the study and practice of health promotion and disease prevention, which is a really lovely part of our specialty. Um, and we work with um, not just infants and children, but adolescents and young adults and all stages of illness. Um, and this is part of our program requirements. Intrinsic to our discipline is scientific knowledge and the scientific model of problem solving and evidence-based decision-making. Um, and I think this underscores not just pediatric practice, but highlights the opportunity for scientists and discovery work in pediatrics. So next slide, please. So um, just so I know there's lots of different learners at lots of different letter, levels. So let me just clarify what our general training pathway looks like. So pediatrics begins for all learners with a three-year general pediatric training program. So the three-year residency program has a focus on general inpatient pediatric care, um, but includes a lot of ambulatory experiences, including continuity clinic and many elective experiences in subspecialty care. Um, all of these programs, including my own, are designed to give you a great foundational experience in being uh, expert in the care of children, being a child advocate, and having the tools for asking evidence-based questions in pediatric. The majority of folks who are doing uh, pediatric research and discovery work, though, continue on after the completion of that residency training to fellowship training. And this is where folks diversify into the 20 different available subspecialties in pediatrics. That ranges from my own infectious disease to things like hematology, oncology, uh, rheumatology, pulmonary, critical care medicine, neonatology, medical genetics, and others. Um, these fellowship training programs are mostly three years, um, and they have in that three-year period typically a subspecialty clinical training period that varies between 12 and 18 months, depending on typically how procedural the specialty is. But something different from the general residency is that all pediatric fellowships have a focus on scholarly work. So if you could move to the next slide. So this is, again, I know you're thinking I'm coughing out, but the words in the, in the program requirements are really useful. So this comes from the program requirements for fellowship where it really emphasizes that the fellowship experience expands uh, physicians' abilities to pursue hypothesis-driven scientific inquiry that results in contributions to literature and patient care. So I think this really highlights at the very front, all of our fellowship training is gonna give you important experiences in discovery work. And we're particularly focused on people who are on the call today who are 
interested in doing discovery and research work already and moving into more mentored experiences at that training level. So the fellowship is really a place where we, we focus on research and peds training. Next slide, please. So uh, as was mentioned already by Dr. Horwitz, the American Board of Pediatrics um, is one of the boards that recognizes the need to promote scientists and really to promote specific pathways that are gonna give you individual uh, autonomy in, in developing a career as a physician scientist. Now, all of these are very well designed. They're also well monitored and they re uh, require the approval of the AB ABP, but they also require on the program's end, close monitoring of the resident and fellow progress, and also critically, the provision of excellent mentoring through every stage of this. I just wanna emphasize something that Dr. Horwitz mentioned already. There are many, dual degree um, trainees on this call, but we are really looking for dual degree as well as MD and DO only students to come in and join us in the world of pediatric discovery work. So for these pathways, these dual degrees are appreciated, but certainly not required. And I'm just gonna talk about the two main pathways so that you get an understanding of what they're about. Next slide, please. The first pathway is called the accelerated research pathway. And this is really a, a very simple one. It really provides uh, an accelerated amount of um, training in the first two years to expand dramatically the time available for research in fellowship training and subspecialties. So residents in this pathway are gonna complete a compressed general pediatric training. They do have some reduced elective time, but they also reduce some of the inpatient training time so that you do have time to explore electives in various subspecialties. Really where you benefit here though, is that three-year fellowship has a full extra year added onto it. In our program, for example, we modify the schedule for fellowship clinical activity to make it a little bit more longitudinal over the four years, but different programs do it different ways. And this really gives a lot of flexibility for the trainee in their subspecialty portion to be excelling in research and hopefully preparing to move to development awards and other levels when they're finishing their fellowship training. If you move to the next slide, you'll see um, the contrast is the integrated research pathway. And the integrated research pathway is designed by the American board to really um, add research and expand research time in the general residency portion of training. So in this pathway, residents do complete a general three years of training, but in that three year period, up to 12 months of research are worked in. And in many of the programs around the country, they are worked in in large contiguous blocks in the second and third year to allow trainees to move through those research rotations. And when they hit their fellowship training, they are really primed and ready to go to continue with the mentor they found already and be very successful. So that added research time is early on in training. Next slide, please. So how do you choose a pathway? So if you're sitting out there and you're interested in pediatrics, I say, fantastic. And if you're asking yourself, how am I going to choose a pathway? This is about you and not about a specific pathway. So there are lots of factors when I counsel uh, trainees uh, thinking about PEDS to consider. You know, what's the, the specific program you're looking at offer? Um, some don't offer both pathways. They concentrate on one and really pour their resources into it. It's also very important to figure out whether you're certain about your fellowship field. Sometimes I'll get someone who comes in who's passionate about immunology and has a PhD in a field of immunology, but hasn't chosen yet between infectious disease or rheumatology or even hematology oncology. So that's someone who often will do an integrated pathway since they have a little bit more time for clinical experiences. And then certainly some trainees say, I would really love to have a three year period of general training to acquire a, a good skill set in general pediatrics. And we're very respectful of that. And then finally, what's the support for research at that program? Um, we certainly have a lot of top tier programs with a lot of research resources, but we wanna connect you to national resources too at any program you might choose. Next slide, please. So, you know, uh, not to um, steal Burger King's um, motto, but have it your way really, really does work here. Um, you know, we have a number of trainees, for example, in my program who do ARP, the accelerated program or integrated program, or they don't do any acceleration or non-standard pathway at all. We just weave in some special experiences in their first three years. And as was mentioned by Dr. Hor Horwitz, a number of programs will offer conditional fellowship entry along with the residency match. So you'll have the opportunity to choose a three-year pathway where you could look at any fellowship or a six-year pathway where you're really gonna have longitudinal mentoring from the beginning of residency to the end of fellowship. And then there are a number of programs 
The NIH STARS program, the R38 support is something that many programs now have to support extra time out of residency or other pathways in residency. Burroughs Welcome um, has sponsored at a number of institutions um, programs in pediatrics to help support folks. And then there's a number of other foundation and individual um, program opportunities to support time off for research if you want to dive in and take a little break from the training as well. And the American Board of Pediatrics is very supportive of this. Next slide, please. And then finally, choosing a program is a complex one. Um, what pathways are available? What's the mentoring environment is probably the most important question you can ask. And whether a program is focused on a three or six year program. And as Dr. Horwitz said, what's their track record? How are they doing? And one thing I wanna emphasize is there are 20 programs that are part of the NPSCW, but even small pediatric programs may have mentors and experiences that'll prepare you to thrive in fellowship and research. Next slide. And then finally, I just a shout out um, for the NPSCW, the group that I'm the new co-chair for. There's now 21 because we're growing all the time. Different departments who are coming together to really share um, resources and ideas here um, and really to focus on bringing programs together to improve pediatric scientist training and uh, child health. Um, we um, have sessions at the Pediatric Academic Societies and the Program Directors Meetings in 2024, but all of our programs are really excited for you to come think about joining us and do some amazing discovery work in pediatrics. That's all for me. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Nowak. And we just had a quick announcement as well. So we actually will be running the Pediatrics uh, PSTP breakout room. We have um, Dr. Anne Chaudhry from uh, Emory, who has volunteered kindly to help lead that session. So we can continue to have that conversation uh, after this. So next up is Dr. Arun Witta from, the, from UCSF, and I'll allow him to continue introducing himself. All right, great. Thanks, everybody, so much for the opportunity to be here. So yeah, so my name is Arun Witta. I'm a Associate Professor in Laboratory Medicine at UCSF. Um, as you'll learn, pathology is split into kind of two subdivisions of both anatomic pathology and laboratory medicine. I'm in the latter. Um, I also run a research lab that focuses on hematologic malignancies and proteomics and cancer immunotherapy. And clinically, I'm a molecular genetic pathologist. Um, really excited to tell you about our physician scientist pathway program, some about our program at UCSF, but also more broadly, about pathology um, and laboratory medicine as an option for physician scientists training. So next slide, please. So thank you. Oh, sorry, that's an intro slide. Um, so overall, as you've heard from Dr. Horwitz in the introduction, really pathology has been one of the most popular fields for MSTP graduates to go into because, and in terms of the size of the specialty, it really is overrepresented in terms of graduates in that context. And really pathology fits the bill and is of interest to many physician scientists in training because you really are closest to integration of science in your everyday practice into what you're doing clinically and making diagnostics. And this spans from tissue-based diagnostics that you look at in anatomic pathology, as we have here on the slide. This is what most people think about in medical school, what you learn about pathology in terms of tissue specimens you're looking at under the microscope, or whether that's autopsy, um, oftentimes in the subspecialization, this is going to be divided by organ systems, whether listed here, G GI, genourinary, GYN, neuropathology. These are all subdivisions of anatomic pathology. That's what most people are familiar with. But there is another subspecialty um, or subdivision within pathology called clinical pathology, also known as laboratory medicine. Um, this is much more involved in running the clinical labs at the hospital. So if you're on the wards, you're sending a troponin for one of your patients, this is going to the clinical labs. There's actually a clinical pathologist who's uh, the director of that laboratory who's in charge of the administration, test interpretation. That's what I do with the molecular genetic pathology. And so this encompasses actually different branches of medicine, but from the lab perspective. So whether that's microbiology, clinical chemistry, clinical immunology, which can involve immunologic testing as well as flow cytometry, transplant laboratory. Um, the one area that has overlap with anatomic pathology is hematopathology, which is essentially where you're analyzing uh, blood specimens or their microscope, as well as transfusion medicine. Um, and so these two sides of pathology really come together to make the entire specialty and within that, and in terms of thinking about physician scientist training, um, one of the big advantages, as I already mentioned, is 
all of these areas, whether it's developing new advanced diagnostics, incorporating new tools, really bridging what's happening in basic science laboratories, oftentimes the place that's first going to hit clinical practice is through pathology. And whether that's tissue-based diagnostics or new tests that are coming into the laboratory. And one of the huge examples mentioned on the slide here is next generation sequencing-based diagnostics, whether in cancer genetics or in constitutional genetics. Um, really, that's been driven by what's been going on translating laboratory uh, basic research into clinical medicine that happens within pathology. And then I think one of the things that's really powerful is if you want to be doing research in your career that really is linking um, disease mechanisms, you have access to those tissues through biobanks, through clinical labs. Uh, many of us who are physician scientists in the field, we take advantage of these resources because all of those samples are coming through the clinical laboratories through the pathology suite. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of actually the way the training pathways are set up, so the vast majority of residents in pathology who are not necessarily on a physician scientist track do a four-year training program um, mixed between, uh, combined between anatomic and clinical pathology. Oftentimes, they will also do uh, fellowships afterwards, which we'll talk about. Um, in physician scientist tracks, most programs strongly encourage, if not require, trainees to choose either anatomic pathology or clinical pathology only. Um, there is one uh, special program that you can match into straight, uh, you can designate an ERAS, is combined anatomic and neuropathology training, which is a four-year training program. Um, what's important to mention is many of the programs that have a physician scientist training track um, really that AP or CP training gets condensed essentially to two years of clinical work. And then your third year is basically your first year of postdoc research. Um, at our program and many others, the goal is really to complete your clinical training first so then you can have an open-ended postdoc and be able at the back end to be able to compete for those career development awards, most specifically a K-08, which is what we try to achieve for the trainees in our program. Um, in terms of fellowships, uh, as opposed to some other subspecialties, most of the fellowships in pathology are a one-year clinical training that do not necessarily include a research component as part of that training. The neuropathology is the only exception. So that's why having physician scientist programs, uh, training programs where you have that guaranteed protected time and research support actually is quite critical for pathologist scientists to enable you to do that additional research to earn that career development award. Um, in terms of the American Board of Pathology does have a uh, designated research track as well that can include six months of designated research time within the core residency times. Um, some programs uh, take advantage of this track at UCSF. We don't have this specific program. We have our own flavor, but this is something to be aware of. And I think um, Dr. Nowak pointed out very nicely, these are the kind of things that you need to figure out from program to program. How do they design their protected time for research for residents that they want to encourage on the physician scientist track? Um, and then in terms of the last bullet point here, um, most research track trainees, again, do either AP only or CP only, typically, um, ideally, only one year of fellowship. Um, and that might result somewhere between three to three and a half years of clinical training before you get back to the lab. And that's really something that we try to emphasize in our program is we know from our experience with trainees the more quickly you can get done, you want to have rigorous clinical training, but the goal really is to get you back in the lab quickly um, to be able to start your postdoc research. And, and really the goal there is we know that the MSTP path is a long one. The physician scientist path is a long one. How can we accelerate your chance of getting to starting your independent research lab and otherwise um, research and faculty independence um, in as short as time as possible? Um, and so, uh, so next slide, please. So in terms of thinking about how to actually apply for pathology and some of the logistics of matching, um, again, I should have mentioned these slides are all from the uh, Association of Pathology Chairs, um, whose website also has additional information. Uh, but basically most programs will e either have separate uh, boxes you can check in ERAS for either combined anatomic and clinical pathology, so APCP, AP only, CP only, or combined anatomic pathology and neuropathology fellowship. Um, and then different institutions will do it differently, something that you need to inquire about if this is the path you're interested in, um, in terms of if there's a separate rank list for the research track only, or whether everything's all combined, different institutions uh, do it differently. Um, again, important thing in terms of flexibility, there is a lot of variability 
from program to program in terms of where that built-in research time can be included. Some programs may have it during the core residency year, some amount of time there, and then more at the back end of the clinical training. Some programs may have that flexibility, for example, to build it, bring in MD-only candidates who may be interested in the research track. Our program at UCSF is much more designed for uh, trainees who've already completed MSTP, already have that PhD research, go straight through the clinical training to a postdoc. But different programs have different philosophies and the way they're built. These are things that you need to investigate during the course of your uh, during the course of your application season. Um, and again, just to say, pathology trainees have incredibly strong outcomes um, in terms of getting to research independence. Uh, overall, in terms of whether K08 awards, which as you all likely know, this is the kind of most common career development award to link your post-clinical training and research to an independent faculty position, but other ones as well, whether Burroughs Welcome Career Award for Medical Sciences, um, NIH Pathway to Independence DP5 awards, um, these are all part of the goals that we hope that pathology scientists can achieve to get to that independent um, faculty position. And um, and again, just, just re-emphasizing some of the data about pathology has been a common path. Next slide, please. So in terms of our program, I just have two very brief slides talking about the way we structured at UCSF. Again, our focus is very much on trainees who want to launch independent laboratory-based research programs with that classic 80-20 split. Different programs in pathology have different um, outcomes that they may be looking for in their trainees. There are other positions in pathology that can be much more 50-50, where maybe you don't run your independent research lab, or maybe you run a very translational research lab focused on new test development, or maybe you provide pathology research services and you're a co-investigator on many grants, but you're not necessarily writing the grants yourselves. You can all be very rewarding physician scientist careers. Um, and so this is one thing in terms of thinking about your own desire and goals in being a physician scientist in the future, what is that type of uh, research to clinical split that you would find most enjoyable? Um, but our, our program is really focused on that classic 80-20 run your own lab. Um, we do require trainees to choose either AP only, CP only, or AP MP. Again, the goal is to ideally have just two to three years of clinical training and then get back to the lab. Um, for us, we do guarantee funding for at least two years and almost all trainees um, can uh, uh, obtain more if they need it in terms of getting to the point of applying and achieving that K award. And then, um, and then we give great flexibility in terms of how many labs you can choose from really unparalleled depth and breadth between the labs between both UCSF and UC Berkeley, um, over 800 different labs that you can choose from in our program. Um, and then one more slide, I think. Thank you. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, we typically are geared toward MSTPs, some MDs who have extensive research experience. What are we looking for? I think there's a common question. Um, for our program in particular, we really emphasize um, prior research experience and research track record from your PhD, um, but different programs may have different criteria that they rank most highly during interview and admission, including that drive to complete and stay on the track. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we're very focused on laboratory-based research. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. That may be the end of my slides. Next one. Yes, and this is just a couple of resources from the Association of Pathology Chairs. Um, it does also list, uh, there's about 22 different designated physician scientist training programs in pathology um, that can, you can access at this, uh, at this website. And, um, and that gives you a sense of uh, who out there offers it and more are being established all the time. All right, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Dr. Rita. Um, so our next panelist is Dr. Chris Pettinger, so I will let him continue to introduce himself as well. Hello, can you hear me? Very good. Uh, my name's Chris Pittenger. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I was just having a little trouble with my audio, but it fixed itself just in time. Um, I'm the director of the research track within the psychiatry residency at Yale University, and I'm, I'm not going to talk much about my, my own program, but rather about research in psychiatry in general. Uh, and I'm looking forward to both this sharing this with you now and to discussion in the second hour. Next slide, please. So, um, I'm going to start, as others have, by giving you an overview of the general structure of psychiatry residency so that everyone here, regardless of where they're coming from, is on the same page. 
Psychiatry is a four-year residency, and it's typically, though not always, integrated, meaning that it's not an internship followed by three years, such as neurology, um, but rather uh, an integrated four-year residency. And this is the typical structure, four to six months of medicine training during year one, four are required by the ACGME, some programs do more, two months of neurology, and then four to six months um, of psychiatry during the first year. I guess it's two to four months. It doesn't, math doesn't quite work out. Um, so that's first year. Uh, then second year is focused primarily on inpatient and hospital-based psychiatry. Uh, typically, six months of inpatient psychiatry, and then blocks of ER, emergency room psychiatry, consult liaison psychiatry, meaning the psychiatric care of patients in the medical or surgical hospital, and then specialty rotations, their requirements in geriatrics and substance abuse and child psych. Different programs may work in these specialty rotations at different times, but they're, they're most common in the second year. Year three focuses on outpatient psychiatry. Um, and so this is uh, longitudinal care, uh, typically in an outpatient clinic setting. Um, different programs may structure this differently. And then year four is usually elective. This is quite variable from program to program. Something about psychiatry residency, the re so psychiatry, if you, if you add up all of the months that are required by the ACGME, sort of the minimum for psychiatry residency, it's not four years. It's about two and a half. Um, the reason that psychiatry residency is four years is because of the need for longitudinal uh, longitudinal experience. Most of psychiatry unfolds longitudinal in the outpatient setting. And that's why this, the residency is four years. But what that means is that in comparison to most other residencies, there's more flexibility relative to the requirements. There's more time for elective time. And again, different programs are going to use that in different ways. But for research tracks, it opens quite a bit of flexibility within the core residency um, without waiting for subsequent fellowship. Um, it is possible to fast track. This is typically done to child psychiatry, meaning that people pack in all of their clinical requirements in three years so that they can go on to child psychiatry fellowship in year four. That's not compatible with a lot of research time because you really have to pack in all your clinical requirements in those three years. Um, and then uh, there are a variety of other clinical fellowships. In addition to child, there are ACGME accredited fellowships in geriatrics, addiction, consult liaison, forensics, meaning the interaction between the, psychi the psychiatrist and the um, and the uh, legal system. And then the rest of those listed here are not ACGME accredited, but are other clinical fellowships that are available. Um, all of these are only one year with the exception of child, which is two years. Um, so that's the general structure. Next slide, please. So as I've emphasized, unlike many other residencies, there's, a, there's, there's more time for electives and flexibility during the residency in psychiatry. And the, um, so that creates quite a bit of flexibility. And again, different programs are gonna take advantage of this flexibility in different ways. Unlike pediatrics and pathology, which you've just heard, of, heard from, there isn't a set research pathway or structure that is laid out by central accrediting bodies. Rather, each program in psychiatry scopes its research track in its own way. And so that makes things a little more complicated for the applicant because there isn't a central template Rather, you need to talk to each program to figure out how they structure things. Um, so during residency third year, which is the outpatient year, typically does allow for some flexibility. And so um, some, patient, some, some programs will allow you to carve out some research time during third year. Fourth year typically allows for quite a lot of flexibility. Depending on how the program is structured, depending on how they fund the time, there can be time to get a substantial amount of research done during fourth year. And then some research track programs provide additional funding to carve out additional time, including sometimes in second year. So it is possible in some psychiatry research tracks to get a longitudinal research program starting in second year so that you can get some momentum to a research program and then really get some speed up during fourth year. Post-residency, very occasionally um, in our program and in some others, um, a resident will be able to take advantage of this flexibility in research time and actually be ready to write a K award during fourth year. This is unusual and it pretty much only happens in patients in, in, uh, in residents with uh, either an MD, PhD or other substantial research prior to residency who are basically continuing to do what they were doing before. So they never lost their momentum. And sometimes those folks can get, um, can get straight to, uh, to writing a K during fourth year. Much more commonly patients will do, uh, <laughs> keep doing that. Residents will do uh, one to a few years of research fellowship post-residency during which they mature their research program 
gather new data and get to the point that they can write the, the K award, the career development award, which is, as you've heard for other programs, usually the gateway to independence and to a faculty career. Next slide, please. Um, so he, these are typical trajectories. The first bullet point I've actually already said, occasionally a, some, uh, a, a resident with a, a lot of pre-existing research experience uh, can be ready to write a K award during the, the fourth year of residency or, or the fifth. Um, something that's quite common, we see a lot of residents who come in with uh, an MD, PhD or other substantial pre-existing research um, experience, but actually switch to a new area of focus, either within their established technical area or in a different area. And actually it's, it's interesting that I'm talking right after pathology because whereas pathology, in pathology, the, the link between research and practice is the closest. In psychiatry, it's probably the farthest. The complexity of the brain and the state of our knowledge is such that there's incredibly exciting science and huge frontiers to be explored, but the gulf between discovery science and the development of new treatments is large. And so many, many, um, residents who have pre-existing experience in discovery science find themselves wanting to switch to more applied science or neuroimaging or more clinically focused work. And that can require some retooling and that requires a little bit more time typically in the fellowship years. Um, and then we do have, we see quite a few residents in our program who may not match into our research track in, initially, but may discover a love of research that, that they discovered late in their MD or not until they get to residency and then switch into uh, research training during residency. And again, the flexibility and elective time make that uh, feasible in psychiatry. And those residents would typically then go on into subsequent years of research training and sometimes into seeking additional degree training uh, at the end of residency. Programs vary quite a bit. And again, it's necessary to contact the individual programs because there is no central template for how these, these research tracks are structured. Next, please. Oh, I guess that was my last slide. <laughs> Pleasure to chat with you and I look forward to discussion in the second hour. Great, so our next uh, presenter will be Dr. Emily Gallagher. I'm just going to take a quick second to transition to those uh, slides and then resume sharing screen. I can share my own if it helps. Is that easier? Sure, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, let me just come in. Thank you. You can see them? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, hi, everybody. Um, I am joining you from Sicily, where it is almost two o'clock in the morning. Um, so bear with me if I'm a little delirious. Um, so I'm an internal medicine, um, at Ben Sinai, I'm an internal medicine, I'm an endocrinologist by training. Um, I direct our ABIM research pathway at Ben Sinai. Um, I also, um, one of the associate program directors for the internal medicine residency program. So if you come to Ben Sinai for residency, either in the ABIM research pathway or in our categorical um, internal medicine residency pathway, um, you will be seeing me overseeing your scholarly activities. And if you come to the ABIM research pathway specifically, I would be your advisor for the course of your residency program. So I'm not going to really talk about Mount Sinai specifically, um, except for to show you a photograph of where Mount Sinai is located. Unfortunately, when you come to interview, you don't get to come here anymore. But this is basically the view from one of our research buildings across Central Park and over to the west side of Manhattan. So being a physician scientist in internal medicine is obviously the best specialty. Um, the others are good, but ours is by far the best. So the biggest advantage of internal medicine is that there are a large number of opportunities for research. Um, really on the full spectrum of everything you can do in research, you can do in internal medicine. Um, there are also a huge number of subspecialty options that you can go into after you do your internal medicine training. Um, so if you are a physician scientist, um, essentially these are your options of subspecialty training in internal medicine. So as you can see, it really covers a huge amount of, um, of areas and within each of these areas, and you can choose to do research in, again, the full gamut of what you can consider research. So a lot of people think when you come into the ABIM research pathway, in internal medicine, you have to be a basic scientist. That is not true. Um, you can be, uh, we see more and more people doing computational. Um, we see people who basically have done MD PhDs and are doing clinical trials. People are more interested in epidemiology now. There's a lot of genetics interest, obviously global health. And you can really be a translational researcher, whatever your background has been, if you do internal medicine. 
So I'm going to keep this very brief and you can ask me whatever questions you want to either in the Q&A or in the breakout sessions afterwards. But essentially, this is where many of you are right now. Um, you will be graduating next year and then you will be wandering around our floors with your stethoscope very soon. Um, so the biggest anxiety I think people have is just like, what is this black box of what comes next? Um, and so essentially, as of next July, many of you will be starting residency programs. After that, you, you don't actually ne necessarily have to do a fellowship. You can do the internal medicine residency program and you can actually stop at that point. Or um, you can do fellowship in any one of these subspecialties that I mentioned, and then essentially you go on to be um, a faculty member. So when you're applying for the internal medicine residency program, I know there's a lot of confusion out there. Um, so we have two broad categories. Um, we consider one the categorical and the other is the research track or the ABIM research pathway. A lot of the confusion comes from the fact that we have called every, um, almost every institution calls their research track something different. So some of them actually call it the ABIM research pathway. We call it the research track. Um, some people call it the position scientist training program. Essentially, you can think of the categorical being uh, the three-year internal medicine residency program. And essentially, most of these other things that are called research somethings are usually all various terms for the ABI and research pathway. So if you're applying to a program and you're not sure what their research track means, just email the program director to verify exactly what their research pathway is. So briefly, the ABI and research pathway in internal medicine is not actually a research in residency pathway. It's slightly different. So basically, the ABI and research pathway condenses your categorical three-year residency program down to two years of clinical training. You do get elective time to do research during those two years of training, and then it's. But essentially, it's the point of it is to shorten your clinical training to accelerate you back into the lab for research. Um, so then, the subspecialties, as I said, the length of your subspecialty fellowship training depends on which subspecialty you chose to do, and then you get this protected time for research afterwards. We can talk more about that if you want. If you have specific questions on it. So just to demonstrate how this works, then I'm going to give you a case, and the case is me. So essentially what I did when I um, came into the ABM research pathway, I did two years of internal medicine residency. I then stayed at Mount Sinai for fellowship. Uh, I did fellowship in endocrinology, which was one year of clinical um, endocrinology and then three years of research. After this, um, I then uh, did, was a faculty member and I had 80% protected time for research for a number of years. Um, I had a career development award, which is a K award, um, which people get at this time and continues to project your research time for five years. And then you go on to develop an independent research career and you, you then ideally get your independent research award. And right now um, I have a mixture of doing research, clinical and administrative work. Um, but as you can see, the pathway uh, to get here goes through many steps along the way. So um, it is a training pathway. Um, it has brought me here to Sicily. I'm actually at a translational um, medicine meeting with international people who are all physician scientists. So it's a fantastic meeting. Um, and if you would like to contact me, here is my email address. Um, the only other thing I'm gonna put in the chat in a second is one, the link to the paper that was mentioned earlier by Chris Williams and Curie, um, based because it gives you a lot of good questions to ask if you are applying this year and you're gonna be interviewing. And the second thing I'm going to put in the chat is another paper that we wrote last year, which basically tells you what uh, program directors are looking for when you're applying to their internal medicine residency programs. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm going to go resume. I'm going to resume sharing my screen again. Okay. And our next presenter is Dr. Stephen Shaw. So I'll let you again take the floor. Um, great. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Chow, and uh, I'll just say thank you to Rohini as well as the Top Synapsa for for organizing this. Um, you know, I guess uh, so. I'm an MD, PhD. I'm um, like many of the other presenters, and um, I'm a breast radiation oncologist and a clinical trialist. Um, but I also run a lab in uh, immunology, so we're focused on the microbiome and um, cancer. Um, and so uh, I wear a couple of different hats. So for our department, I, I lead the basic science program, and I also lead one of the uh, program, one of the clinical trial programs in our cancer center. So. Um, 
So I guess, you know, it's always a hard act to follow internal medicine. So, um, cause they're like super organized and really, really great. And we are a very small specialty, but, um, but I think there are a couple, uh, um, things that I'll just tell you a little bit about it. And, um, you know, um, and uh, just I'll, I'll put the caveat that we're we're just not as uh, we're not as together as uh, internal medicine. <laughs> um, uh, all right, next slide. Um, so um, so I think um, as you might expect, uh, radiation oncology, you know, is a very um, it is topically focused. It's almost a little bit like uh, starting your fellowship early um, because it's it's very oncology focused, as you might expect, and. Um, and so, um, but uh, we do do a lot of uh, unique avenues of research. I think that there are some things in radiation oncology that are not offered by some of the other specialties. So um, of course, radiation biology, um, but um, but in fact, we, we are very interested in technology development. So I would say we have a fair number of researchers that do um, a lot of uh, medical fix, for instance, which is sort of uncommon except for radiology, who you'll hear from, um, as well as as, uh, image analysis. So we have a lot of groups, um, especially like in my department, that work on AI and developing AI tools for um, for integrating um, oncology care, imaging, and treatment. So, um, and then I think one of the kind of underappreciated opportunities, and so in cancer, um, uh, there are sort of three, uh, we, we sit as a three, three-legged stool. So radiation, um, chemo, chemotherapy or sort of medical oncology as well as surgical oncology. And so there's an opportunity. So most of our disease research groups include a radiation oncologist. And so you kind of sit, um, you know, at the table where you get to have a chance to, um, you know, lead one of the cancer therapy, you know, lead one of the cancer therapy groups. Um, and that's um, pretty important. And then I think, you know, more so than even any other, some of the other specialties, you know, we're very scientifically driven. We're a very data driven field. And I think that that's just because we're so cancer focused and so many trials are running cancer. And so we, we love data. It's like our favorite thing. And so, um, and so uh, next slide. And so, um, oh, again, so I said, uh, so we kind of uh, did a poll, informal poll at one of our, our national meetings. And so um, it'd be great if we um, published a paper, but we haven't. Um, but, um, but, you know, we have a lot of common MD, PhD disciplines really looking. Um, of course, there are traditional ones, such as the you know, ones that are focused in cancer biology, but, um, but we have a number of unique ones. So we have a lot of biophysics and biochemists as well as engineers um, and uh, data scientists and chemists. And so there's a lot of uh, a lot of unique opportunities in radiation oncology for um, pursuing for some of the um, different science um, to um, kind of have their day. Um, all right, uh, next next slide, please. Oh, great. Thank you. And so, um, so we are, so we are having, uh, we our traditional pathway is, um, you know, we're a one plus four specialty. So we typically have one year of internal medicine or a transitional year, which you know involves a lot of different rotations across multiple specialties. And then uh, radiation oncology is, um, you know, additional four years. So there is. Uh, sort of mandated clinical training for about three of those years, but most residencies incorporate uh, research time just to begin with. So we typically have residents that have somewhere between three to six months, but that are sort of extendable. Um, and then there's elective time. Um, so um, we don't have any special uh, kind of fellowships the way internal medicine would in terms of, you know, uh, endocrinology or neurology, but um, but the or but what we do have is uh, modality specialties, and so um, so peds is its own discipline, um, as well as uh, proton and brachytherapy. So brachy is sort of a procedural one. Those are typically one year, but um, they often incorporate a second year for um, for doing uh, research uh, directly. And then one that um, I did is a is research and residency um, program. So this is um, in conjunction with the ABR. So radiation oncology belongs to the American Board of Radiology, and so their sponsor they sponsor a pathway. Um, called the Holman pathway and the Holman pathway um, shortens the clinical time. So typically it goes from 36 months to um, uh, about 24 months. Um, and, uh, and then usually most of the Holman's work that the rest of the time is devoted for research. And then that research extends into um, uh, kind of a clinical instructor slash fellowship position on, until you, um, you know, typically receive, you know, additional funding. So we, we kind of aim for Ks or DP5s or some of the other things that have been mentioned already. All right, next slide. 
Oh, sorry, maybe I go. Oh. Okay, um, great. And so as I mentioned, you know, there's the Holman path. Oh, sorry, uh, maybe go one more back, if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, oh, thanks. Um, so, um, so again, uh, so, um, the, so we, as I mentioned, there's the Holman pathway, but some of the other ones, so because radiation oncology is a smaller specialty, we typically don't sponsor our own sort of physician scientist training programs. Most of the programs aren't large enough to be able to have, have one of their own, but many of the, um, of the radiation oncology programs will participate in institutional PTSP. So for instance, um, CEDARS, um, sponsors, uh, a PTSP program. For it, which is a multidisciplinary PTSP, and so it's institutional, and so um, it's sponsored through um, uh, through our ACGME, and it provides two years of uh, additional funding after um, residency. So it it's, it acts as a fellowship, but um, but in in essence, it gives you kind of that extended time for um, laboratory based research. Um, so not every institution has it, but it's um, but if you're looking at radiation oncology and you're interested in this pathway, you could do something like a Holman plus a PTSP program. Um, okay, next slide. And so, um, so just for some stats, I mean, we do, uh, so I would say um, we, as I said, we're a pretty small specialty. So typically um, each year we have uh, about 150 um, uh, slots open. And then of those 150, about 10% are um, laboratory-based researchers, so physician scientists. And um, But uh, we're, but many, over half, go into um, academic uh, kind of institutions for clinical research. So uh, many of the MD-PhDs that come, you kind of are split. Obviously, there are some that are very determined to do laboratory research, which is fantastic, and we love that. Um, but um, but there are also a lot of uh, clinical research and clinical uh, clinical trial pathways that can be open for um, in within radiation oncology. And then last slide. Oh, sorry. Oh, and then uh, I put this in. Uh, obviously, other specialties, medicine needs no, no talking about this. Their, their numbers would be like 10 times this size. So um, so I'm sure they don't do that. But just, just as an example, you know, because we're a small specialty, um, you know, there is a lot of funding in radiation oncology. So we have a lot of uh, NIH funding, and we even have our own uh, our own program at the NCI. So, um, so there. So, let's what you think we're out there alone by ourselves. Um, you know, there's a there's there's a lot of active research going on in radiation oncology that sometimes is a little underappreciated. So, so that's it. And hello, I'm David Mankoff. Um, I am uh, in the red background because it's red October here in Philly. Um, the game is over. I will not spoil it for those um, that don't know what the answer um, is that haven't been watching on ESPN. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I am a, a professor in the Department of Radiology at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm also the vice chair of radiology and the research pro uh, track program director that is a T32 supported program, and I'll go back and talk a little bit about that. I also have a secondary role in AD for education and training in the Abramson Cancer Center. Um, I, I'm, I'm a clinician scientist that works in molecular imaging with a focus on translational breast cancer research. Um, I'm a little bit unusual because um, when I trained, nuclear medicine was a residency, and I did internal medicine where I met uh, uh, Dr. Horowitz at the University of Washington, and then um, and then nuclear medicine, um, which takes you to a radiology department. These days, pretty much everybody that goes that pathway comes from radiology, and so I'm really been focused on um, radiology-based uh, training and education and physician scientist um, pathways. Also want to credit um, Pam Woodard, um, who runs their uh, physician scientist um, uh, training program and, um, um, and is the chair of their department. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so why, why radiology research training? Um, and and it, this slide could be pretty much any of the specialties that we've talked about so far. Um, you need MD only and MD PhD scientists to understand the scientific method, uh, can successfully navigate the NIH and other funding agencies, um, can apply for K funding or equivalent funding um, early in their careers, uh, can manage a laboratory and become independent investigators. 
So that's probably a slide you could have heard for any specialty, but this is an evolving process in radiology, uh, which really in the in the last 10 to 15 years has gone from a, being a pretty clinically oriented um, uh, specialty to having a fairly um, significant clinical uh, and clinician investigator research component. Next slide, please. Um, so why radiology research training? Um, again, it's going to fill the gap between basic science and clinical practice in a technology-driven field. So we're not just about technology, but it's a big part of what we do. And those technologies can include imaging instrumentation technology methodology. That's actually what I did my PhD in, imaging devices, image generation. Um, we are increasingly one of the higher end applications of Im imaging informatics and analytics. And, and really there's some very leading edge um, AI work that's going on there. And then what my specialty is now is really molecular imaging and image guided therapy. So we were traditionally a diagnostic specialty only, but in things like nuclear medicine, interventional radiology, and a few other specialties were more and more um, uh, taking on image guided um, uh, approaches. Um, now, besides developing methodology, um, radiology um, and the diagnostic methods and molecular methods provide really um, rather unique opportunities uh, to use these tools to look at in vivo cancer biology in a way that's very difficult otherwise. And so we have reported methods. We're, we're one of the leading ways of measuring in vivo metabolism, brain connectivity, uh, radio genomics, and emerging field and imaging biomarkers. And so there is an opportunity to do everything from do basic methodology development to applications toward biomedical research um, to reading tra leading translation of these new methods into the clinic, which is a, a big part of my current um, current research. Uh, next, um, next slide, please. Now, the other reason is our funding is going up. This went to about 2019. That curve has continued to rise. You can't read the numbers, but we're up to about, as a field, um, probably about seven, eight hundred, nine hundred million dollars uh, and altogether in funding. We may have actually exceeded a billion um, this year. So there's a lot of need and opportunity for people that do radiology research. Um, next slide, please. Um, so who who might be folks that come from um, um, an MD-PhD program or a strong MD-only program? What kind of disciplines would lead them to be able to, to undertake research radiology? Well, importantly, molecular biology and pharmacology, which are traditionally things uh, that might go along with something like medicine, for example, are, are increasingly part of what we do in molecular imaging and theranostics, radiopharmaceutical therapy, um, genetics, computational bio biology and bioinformatics that gets into radiomics, radiogenomics, other applications of AI that are really becoming in the front lines. Neurosciences dovetails very nicely with um, a broad range of tools for neuroradiology. And then biochemistry and biophysics and, and physical sciences in, in general um, work well for imaging probes and devices, which are still an important part of research. Now, there are other disciplines that are a little less common, like physics and engineering. That was my background, um, where you end up doing scanner development, uh, develop in image generation image analysis and image generation um, uh, in image um, uh, formation. Um, there's data science and computer science, a very if rapidly increasing part of what we're doing, um, where we're doing a lot of really high-end AI and data science here. And then we actually have quite a bit of activity going on in chemistry uh, for probes, theranostics, radiochemistry um, as a, a unique and weird branch of, uh, of chemistry. Next slide, please. So this is what radiology GME pathways look like. Uh, the standard diagnostic radiology has a one-year internship. Um, it has four years of residency, so PGY1, PGY2, PGY3, PGY4 in the NIH parlance, um, where, where internship is PGY0. Um, and what happened about 10, 15 years ago is it went from having that completely crammed with, um, with general training to now offering an opportunity for, for some subspecialty concentration and flexibility in the fourth year. And I'll, that's really where we do most of our physician scientist training program. Um, uh, academic radiology now pretty much has subspecialty training that is somewhat by modality, but usually by body area like neuro um, or abdominal. And, and most of these programs uh, provide an opportunity at the more academic centers for additional research. We have two other pathways that are important. Um, there's interventional radiology um, uh, together with with, uh, diagnostic radiology and integrated IRDR program. This is a fairly clinically oriented specialty, but opens up the possibility of doing research in the context of an interventional radiology training. Um, there's also an opportunity to, an, to do an integrated pathway 
um, uh, through a, a Nuclear Radiology Fellowship is actually part of your uh, residency. It's a great pathway for subspecialty training. Some have used it for research, um, but those bottom two pathways tend to be a little bit more clinically specialized. But the Diagnostic Radiology Pathway, and I'll show you an example in a second, really has opened up the possibility for us to have a, a variety of training programs. So next slide, please. Um, so we have the same board as radiation oncology. And so as you heard um, uh, previously from Stephen, uh, we, we have this common uh, Holman pathway, which looks fairly similar uh, to radiation oncology. It has at least 18 months of research embedded into four years of training. Um, and, and, and it is really a one-off for the most part. Um, there are programs that will permit that. And, and each person coming into that pathway that desires to go that way um, ends up developing a program and getting approval from the ABR. Uh, what's emerged over the last probably um, 10, 10 or so years um, is uh, formal radiology PSPTs. And these have typically been supported by grants. And a lot of them have been supported by um, grants from this um, relatively small but um, focused um, NIH um, Institute, the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. Um, and so there are now uh, a handful of programs that have had these T32s for a while. Uh, we're one of them. I'm going to show you that example in the bottom. These have separate match entities. So you can actually apply to the research track. We take three people per year that start at the research track from the moment they enter radiology. Um, uh, there are others um, with T32s that have a slightly different approach that can support a variety of scientists, including imaging cl clinician scientists, and a number of other programs that are not grant supported but follow this model. Um, so in our model, we start with a fairly traditional first year with a little bit of exposure to research. We then have graded research exposures over the PGY2 and PGY3. And PGY4 becomes, in essence for us, a, a, a postdoc year, um, especially for those that have had a, a PhD already, and is really a concentrated full year opportunity to develop a postdoctoral project. And uh, what we do is we do guarantee um, that if, if you had satisfactory completion, we will accept you into one of our fellowships. We can't chain your um, feet to our to the desks at Penn. Um, the ACGME won't do that, but we strongly encourage that because it allows us to integrate um, your research in, on and into the fellowship. Um, and so the programs all vary a little bit, but all of them offer these integrated programs. And, and one of the advantages of this approach is that you um, design your research years once you've had an understanding of, of how that might dovetail into the clinical um, uh, specialty, which is actually fairly important in radiology as a largely applied science. Um, in my um, final slide, I think, um, um, and like you saw from Stephen, we've had a great deal of success through these programs. These are two of our um, stars who now have a couple of more coming along. Um, these programs are now yielding lab scientists um, pretty much like you might find in medicine or pathology or some of the other uh, pediatrics, some of the other specialties we mentioned. And um, who you, the folks you see here now, Terrence Gade, who's now the assistant program director, and Mark Selmeyer, who will probably be the, another assistant program director one day, um, both went through our programs. Uh, both were the first two um, radiology faculty ever to get um, the DP5 Independence Award. Um, uh, Terrence has um, now got another director's award in a transformative of R01, and Mark has successfully navigated his DP5 to get at least one R01 and probably has more coming. So I'm bragging a little bit for some of the stars of our program, uh, but it just goes to show you that the same type of scientific success that you come to in a little bit more uh, traditional specialties is now starting to branch out into these other specialties, as you've heard tonight. So with that, I will close, um, give those fans that want to a chance to check what the score is, and, um, and thank you very much. Thank you for those words, Dr. Mankoff, and apologies for the transition between Dr. Shao's and your slides. My microphone unmuting button disappeared for that time. <laughs> it, it worked perfectly. I, I almost started to tell a joke, but that would have scared everybody off from radiology. So. <laughs> Appreciate you rolling with the rolling with the flow of this one. Um, okay, so now we are in the interest of time. We're just going to ask two questions that are broadly applicable to a lot of our students here, and then we will transition to the breakout room sec section. Um, and I'd like to give Dr. Anne Charudi the opportunity to introduce herself live. I know you mentioned your credentials in the chat, but if you'd like to share now, um, that would be great as well. 
Okay, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ann Sherudi, and I um, am at Emory and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. Um, I started our uh, research and residency slash PSTP program now several years ago. We call it um, Pediatric Residency Investigative Scholars at Emory, or PRIZE, program. Um, and I'll just keep it short because I'm happy to answer questions in the chat. Um, and it's great to be here. I'm a, a Philadelphia transplant, so I guess I'm sad about the Braves, but happy about the Phillies. I'm not giving away anything, but just in general. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so for all of our uh, directors, uh, one question that we've seen at least some iteration of is the concern about the alignment between their PhD topic of research and the ultimate residency track that they choose. So in um, your experience, how well, uh, how well is that synergy kind of uh, involved in, in ultimately influencing whether their application is viewed as strong or if it hurts them in any way? If you could speak to that, that would be great. Should we go in order of how we present it or how do you want to do it? Sure, that works. And if you do agree with a previous panelist, just again, in the interest of time, um, you don't you don't need to mention that again, or you can just ditto them in the chat. That would be great. Sure. Dr. Sherwood, do you want to go first then? Because Pete's is first. Oh, sure. Um, well, I would say that um, that's not something that we are very hung up on in pediatrics in terms of your um, application. I think that, um, you know, if, if there, if, you know, you had a fantastic PhD and that matches, you know, say you're an immunology PhD and then you want to go into pediatric infectious diseases, just, you know, using myself as an example, that's fine. But if you have a change of um, direction, that's also fine too. I think unlike some other specialties, I find that many folks coming into pediatrics are somewhat um, undifferentiated in terms of their um future uh, subspecialty. And, and so that we kind of expect that and, and give you the chance to experience um, different areas before kind of solidifying your um, fellowship plans. Yeah, and I'll just say from the pathology perspective, I think we're fortunate that pretty much every field of medicine and science can fit under the umbrella of pathology. So let's give an example of our three research track trainees who meshed last year. One did her PhD in neurorobotics, one did her PhD in tumor immunology, and, and the other one did his PhD in genetics of glioblastoma. So it can really span the game. So in psychiatry, I, I, we people often discover psychiatry late. I'd say that we see two categories. We see people who have been loved neuroscience from the beginning and have done a PhD in neuroscience and, and are, you know, have been sort of aligned with psychiatry from early on. But we see quite a lot of people who did a PhD in something that is at least superficially completely unrelated and then discovered, you know, may have not considered psychiatry uh, until they hit it in the clinics and then and then discovered a love for it rather late. And so, um, I mean, certainly having having, you know, having a, a lot of advanced training in neuroscience is a plus. But we've had enormously successful people who've come through with a PhD in molecular genetics, in immunology, and any number of other things, and then dramatically retooled their focus during residency. It may take them a year or two longer, but at the end of the day, um, they're just as successful. And so we don't we 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 consider, um, you know, the, any any kind of successful background uh, in in science training to be to be relevant. I agree. I put a picture in the, in the chat of uh, basically the abstract of our paper from JCI Insight last year, and, and you can have a look at it, but basically I think most um, program directors would agree in internal medicine. Dr. Shaw, if you have anything to add. Yes, and I, uh, yeah, and I think in radiation oncology, I mean, we, we would think the same thing. I mean, or I think some of our best uh, researchers have been surprising have done surprising PhDs, um, you know, myself included. I I did, you know, I was a T cell biologist, and then I ended up in radiation oncology, and you know, I studied the microbiome, which is kind of you know really interesting, and so did, and you know so unexpected, and so I think we really like to see, um, you know, I think just commitment to research. I think that's what we think is the difference. 
and I can do a relatively short ditto. One of one of the interesting things about radiology is a fairly clinically intensive specialty, and so we tend to look at clinical records a little bit more seriously than people might expect. Uh, but within that context, and people coming from uh, MD PhDs, it pretty much in any PhD will work. Um, we tend to take folks with some more technical backgrounds out of proportion to what other specialties might have. Um, but we have people doing molecular biology, computational biology, um, um, a variety of different specialties. One person in the program right now where she and her husband are both fundamental neuron biologist and do action potentials and things of that sort. So we're trying to find the right lab for her. And I said, maybe you can find a lab that could combine that with diffusion imaging or something that would be relevant to that. Um, so there's usually an application um, um, in, in part of our specialty for just about anything that comes through. Great. Thank you so much for all your responses. And the second question I wanted to pose to all of you is, how do you recommend applicants in this virtual setting uh, to best garner an impression of a program that they're going to call home for the next few years of their training? Um, what are the best tips and ways that they can get the best impression, the truest and most authentic impression of a program? I'd say talk to trainees and recent graduates. I mean, programs are going to put a lot of thought into how to how to convey information slash advertise themselves in the interviews and Zoom sessions. And I think that you may get You'll get data that way, but you get unvarnished data from talking to trainees and recent graduates. That seems like a widely yeah. concurred opinion. Oh, yeah. It's Dr. Yeah. Ditto. Ditto. Yeah. No, I would say it's the exact same thing. I think it's just making sure that, you know, I would say it, when you're interviewing, if a program doesn't have the opportunity to talk to trainees, that's maybe a red flag from your side, basically, because that is the time to, to really find out, especially in our era of virtual visits I, I, it's incredibly challenging I, I, I really you know feel bad for you all that you can't go visit sites easily even though it's definitely good from an expense perspective not to have to fly around the country but it, it is it is really hard to make the decision so i think getting the best impression if you have other friends who live in that city too that's a good way to learn about it so the, the other thing i might um Ed, is that um, you you have a long runway, and I don't think it's inappropriate as you're trying to decide specialties, especially for something like ours, where it's a little less common pathway, uh, to contact program directors, to, con to contact some of us on this call, uh, to set up an opportunity to talk about the program and talk to some of our, our leaders. If you do that um, on the fall that you apply, then it looks a little contaminated by your desire to get an, an interview. Um, and so programs may have some reluctance to do that. But if you're a year or two before you're getting started and you're saying, hey, I'm starting to look at radiation oncology and internal medicine and radiology, I want to talk to those folks a little bit. That's a pretty low pressure way to talk to them, understand their programs. And if it sounds of interest from your research, um, to even talk to some of their trainees. And I, I think you'll find all of us quite willing to do that. Also advocate for being frank about maybe um, sometimes I think your tendency is to uh, one might have a tendency to beat around the bush about wanting to do research or something like that or or something you like. And if you know, sometimes you don't know, but if you know, it's just easier to ask, especially in this kind of setting, maybe in a nice way, point blank and just say, you know, kind of what would you support that and what what it, what do you think about that? And I think sometimes you can get a better answer that way and people would be more honest. Great. Thank you all so much for your responses. So we're going to transition to the breakout room portion. So I'll turn it over to Carrie, who's going to explain the assignments, and I'll also put um, some text into the chat. Great. Thanks to all our panelists for all those um, awesome presentations and answers to the general questions. So we've opened the breakout rooms, and there's one per specialty um, labeled with the specialty, and everyone should be able to assign themselves to a breakout room. You're welcome to hop in a breakout room if you have multiple interests and you have time you're welcome to excuse yourself um, or kind of irish exit and just hop into another one if you have multiple interests um Rohini has pasted um the specialties again in the chat um and if you have trouble joining assigning yourself to a breakout room just let me know and i'll help you uh, move into the rooms themselves and as a reminder to our breakout room moderators please record your individual rooms as well Let me know if anyone has trouble accessing the breakout rooms and I can also help assign people over. Uh, 
breakout room. He need do do we need to do anything? I need to assign myself to a breakout room. As yes. Well, or... um, so if oh, you okay. go to the breakout room section, you can just pick the one with your specialty. Okay, great. I will do that. It'll be your group to field questions with. I thought okay, that was I'm not great. Seeing Thanks for doing all this. Yeah, thank you so much for all the help and support in organizing. Really, like tapping into the AAMC's resources has been very instrumental in crafting this session. Okay, I will hop into one of the breakout rooms as well, just to help. Um, but thank you so much again. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. All right, we'll be in touch. Yeah, no, it's really great to put a name to the face. And um, yeah, I would, I guess I'll see you on the next version and the next iteration of this. <laughs> yeah, likewise. All right. <laughs> Have a good rest of your evening. Bye.
Hey, Carrie. I think we're still recording now, um, <laughs> main session, but I just wanted to check in for the breakout room. I don't think I saw anything download. I just want to make sure that it lives somewhere. I think it will record on your, like, it'll convert to the MP4 when the Zoom ends. It's okay. like when you Zoom or when the Zoom ends. Okay. And it'll come, it'll be on my local. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Wherever your like Zoom folder is. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to close the rooms now. Thank you, everyone. Um, you're all free to go, and we will follow up by email with contact information and any additional follow up from this session. Have a good night. Yes. Thank you, Rohini. You did a great job. <laughs> you.